really great fun night coming up, November 24th. A lot of people are excited about this, it's called Sweets in the Sweets. Why do we do this? Well, how many of you on Thanksgiving don't have enough room to eat the dessert after the big meal, right? That dessert table stays full, and you're like, oh, I've got to take dessert home. I've got to take the dessert home that I fixed. Now I've got to eat all this all by myself. Well, we just eat the dessert the night before, okay? Do the best part first. So, sweets of the sweet, 6 p.m., in the youth room, it's going to be fun. We're going to have milk. We're going to have coffee. We're going to have hot chocolate, apple cider if you like that, water if you don't. Uh, I'm not a milk drinker, but I will drink chocolate milk. Um, but, I don't know. I, I never really cared for the taste of milk. But some of you, Pastor John, he's a whole milk drinker. He loves whole milk. There have been weeks where I've had to buy um, three gallons of milk for a week for my boys. And so, yeah, that's one thing. So, hope you come out to that. I hope you have enjoyed this series. Uh, it's called Rebuild or Tear Down. And it's going through the story of Nehemiah. But it's going through with a different perspective. See, what took me on this road was I like to read. Okay? I read a lot. Um, I read different books. I, I read my Bible, but I also read different things. I um, want to identify things to grow, right? And so I will read books on dealing with rejection, okay? I will read books on letting go of control. I will lead, read books on my purpose, right? Am I enough? Can I do what I do? being who I am. So I'll read books about that. I will read these books, but they're spirit love books. I'm not a non, I'm not a fiction reader, so I've never been into like fantasy stuff, but I read other books. Uh, and I read my Bible. I um, went through a journey of where I decided to read uh, my Bible, but it was in a different way than most people do. I didn't read it from Genesis to Revelation. I was like, I can't get past by the time I hit numbers I go cross-eyed um, so <laughs> I decided to read it in little chunks and I started in the New Testament I have read John before so I read his epistles and then I read different other epistles in, in John because I wanted to see because I read the first four books so it's like okay let me see the growth in our disciples and so I read those and then I went to the Old Testament prophets I moved all around until I had finished reading it this year I'm going through the chronological Bible and I'm reading it that way and I had come across um, Isaiah and some of the things that just stood out. And one of my favorite things about Isaiah, and I had originally read it in the message translation. I'm reading it in the uh, Amplified now. But what I love is how he talks about Jesus. Because Isaiah talks about how, you know, Jesus was going to come. He prophesied about his coming. He also prophesied about other people uh, like King Cyrus who was known in Nehemiah. And so, but it's like, yeah, I just thought it was amazing how God called out this man's name even before he was born. It's like, that's just so cool because, you know, we, he formed us and he knew us before we were in our mother's womb. But did you know he knew your name? He called you forth. And that was just amazing. And so Jesus is referred to as the Prince of Wholeness is one of his names in Isaiah in the message translation. The Prince of Wholeness. See, Jesus has to be your savior before he can be anything else. But he's more than that. He's also the prince of wholeness. In the King James Version, Mark 6, 56, it says, And whithsoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch it, if they might touch, if it were by the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. So what is the definition of healing to you? So wherever I read about Jesus healing, his intent was not just to touch an area of need. His intent was to make us whole. So his intent, when I touched him and have him as my Lord and Savior, his intent was to make me whole. Right? So Nehemiah means Jehovah comforts. He's the personification of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. It is not a thing, a person. 
His will is to restore, heal, and build back life into us. He's going to point us back to Jesus, and he's going to point us back to the word. So the Holy Spirit will not lead you to be alone. You need community. He didn't go to rebuild the wall alone, did he? Right? He needed support. He couldn't do it by himself. We can't do it alone. We need each one of us. We are the body of Christ, right? Okay. Then we also need to investigate areas that need repair. Like I said, investigate that needs repair. That means I've been willing to identify and look straight on the area. Not run away. Not say it's not there. I turn around and look straight on to defeat that thing so I can grow. So I can be free. Because running is not freedom. Denying is there is not freedom. So there's 12 gates. Only 10 are mentioned in Nehemiah. And I thought it was interesting because each one of them, being as, you know, that Nehemiah being a symbol of the Holy Spirit, a type and shadow, each one of them points back to Jesus. I thought that was quite cool. Uh, how I go into this research? Well, I was reading a book on the spirit of rejection. And it was talking about how Nehemiah, when we go through this, he was talking about the rubble and how exhausting it is to get rid of the rubble how we need the support and we need to rest and there's sometimes you can't do all the work in one day right and then it mentioned the 10 gates I was like well let me go back and do research on the 10 gates after I finish this get, finish this book so that's what I did that's that's where this came from so this comes from me doing doing the work in myself so it's going to point back to Jesus so 12 is a special number that God has for his people. We talked about it when I did Fresh Bread. If you haven't listened to that message, that was pretty good, where we talked about coming in with the expectation of not to receive, but present fresh bread to him. Right? We don't come into the house empty-handed in a, a fill-me-up. We come in with fresh bread. I have an anointing. I need to deliver this to him. I do this in worship. So there was the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples, but 10 is also a special number. In the blessed life, we talked about the tithe. The tenth, 10 means test. He tells us to test him in one thing, in tithes. Test him in his word. The number... So the Hebrew letter that equals 10 is called the Yud. It's the smallest Hebrew letter. The symbolic meaning of Yud it means God's hand. Think about that. The smallest thing means God's hand. Can you trust him? God's hand works or interacts in our lives. The tenth, the tithe, allows him access to the rest of our life if we look at it that way because he's going to bless the rest right but we give access to it see I have tithers rights I have tithers rights that means that if the enemy comes and tries to destroy my family I have tithers rights right God's hand is going to be on them and work in them I have tithers rights my finances if there's something that comes up I have tithers rights, right? So that's one thing that, you know, talks about that. So the 10, there was 10 things. So there's 10 gates that we're going to talk about. And the, it's going to reveal Jesus. These gates are a type and shadow of Jesus. And I want to explain it this way. There's a fullness to the gospel. Okay? There's the good news, and then there's the gospel. Right? He said to go out into all the world. And we, we preach the gospel. We share the good news, but we preach the gospel. Right? The good news is found in the first gate. In I 3 1, it talks about the sheep gate. Apart from accepting Jesus, I have to accept Jesus to be fully restored. I have to accept Jesus as my savior before anything else can happen 
in my life. I will never be completely fulfilled without Jesus in my life. John 10, 7 through 9 says, So Jesus said again, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, I am the door for the sheep leading to life. And who came before me as false messiahs and self-appointed leaders are thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever and will go in and out freely and find pasture spiritual security. I have fire insurance when I go through the sheep gate. <laughs> okay? I have that. Second gate is the fish gate. And that's found in Nehemiah 3.3. 3. The fish gate. Why is that important? Because in Matthew 4.19 it says, and he said to them, follow me as my disciples, accept me as your master and teacher, walking the same path of life that I walked. Remember he said, walking the same path of life that I walked, and I will make you fishers of men. In order to be a fisher of men, to go through the fish gate, I've got to be a disciple. I've got to change some things about me. Now, I didn't have to change anything to go through the first gate. He's going to do these things inside of me. But I've got to, hey, am I willing to walk this out? Now, I've already got my fire insurance. But remember, he's more than just my savior. He wants to be my prince of wholeness. I don't want to just survive here. I want to thrive here. Okay? That, so, the third gate or is the old gate. Nehemiah 3.6 is where we found that at. And I like this because in the early church, they had to be reminded of who Jesus was. They had to remind themselves of what he'd done in their lives. They had to re it, was even, it wasn't even three generations that had left. It's not even 30 years, and they're being challenged in the deity of who Jesus is. Jesus was a great man, and yes, he walked the earth and did miracles, but he wasn't the son of God. That's what that was being told to the church. And that's one thing they had to fight. They had to fight, did Jesus really do these things? Or did you imagine it? Do you have firsthand knowledge of it? And see, the old gate to me is the, the transformation. It's my, my why, right? See, the old gate, I have to constantly remind myself of my why. I remember my moment. I remember where I was in my moment when I accepted Christ. Now, I have had conversations about who Jesus is. Well, I've known Jesus all my life. False. You've known of Jesus all your life. Could have been raised in it. But you don't know Jesus all your life. Because there's a moment that happens when you say, I need to know you. There's a moment. And I remember my moment. And so that old gate that we have to constantly remind ourselves, this is the reason why. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, have passed away. Behold, new things have become, because spiritual awakening brings new life. So I have to, this old gate, I've got to walk back and forth in. I've got to remind myself. I've got to remind myself of my why. Why? Because if I can't remind myself of my why, how am I going to share the good news? See, all of us are called to evangelism. All of us are. We are all called to talk to somebody about the good news. We, and it took me some time to figure out. I was all in my head about it. We can't be in our head about it. But I've got to make my heart, my why. That's how I've led those to the Lord. All right, so, and then John 4, 16 says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one that comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too. So we've got that gate. Now I'm saying walking back and forth at these gates because we got to come back to them. We can't forget about them, okay? This isn't a 10-step program and when I get to this, I'm done. No, it is not done until you are in that ground, okay? Um, so 
<laughs> we got to keep doing this as long as we have breath in our lungs. Um, the fourth gate is the valley gate. No, Nehemiah 3.13 says um, about the valley gate. This is the gate with the longest expansion to the next one. This is the biggest field out there, and it's called the valley gate. This is where growth happens. This is where fruit's grown. This is where we go through our trials, where we think, dig things up. And we have to move things around. This is in the valley. This is the area that we're most vulnerable. This is the area where we lot don't like to be in. But this is where growth happens. John 15, 5 through 8 in the Passion Translation says, I am the sprouting vine and you're my branches. And you live in union with me as your source, your fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. So if a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you live in life, union with me and my words, live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it would be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are the mature disciples who glorify my Father. I want to bear good fruit. So I need to go through the valley for it to produce. Now, on the mountain, it's cool to look down, and it's cool to be up there, because I don't have much work to do. I mean, I'm sitting there. But in the valley is where growth happens, right? There's a lot of room for us to have a shing of relationship with Christ. There's a lot of room for that. And that should be our hunger and our desire is to be, sit there. See, I have a unique relationship with him. The way I talk to him is going to be different the way that Pastor John talks to him. It's going to be different. And I can't, we can't do it the same way. I can't force my children to do it the way that I do it because it's unique to us what my job is is to model the relationship I have with him so they hunger and desire one as well they can see a difference in me my kids know when mommy hasn't spent enough time and know what they will give me the time because they like me better when I am okay Pastor John's like yup <laughs> <laughs> the next gate and I spent some time on this one last week is called the refuse gate and that's in Nehemiah 314 so when we're working on restoration projects when we're working on these things there's trash that comes up right and I could repurpose them and find a different use for it or I could throw it away sometimes we see something, I think I can do something with it, and then we put it away, and we forget about it. We're building up a wall. We're building up a wall that eventually is going to come back and get us. It's going to keep us from moving on from something, because I, I'm putting this aside for, I might need it later on. But you haven't touched it for six years. Pastor John and I are constantly moving things around. We, I just moved around my living room and, and cleaned a bunch of stuff, and I, I threw away things that I didn't need, I hadn't seen, and I just got rid of it. Because if I haven't used it in a certain amount of time, I don't need it. And if I have the thought process, if I've got to hold on to it, because if I lose it, I don't know how I'm going to survive when I do think about it eight, ten years from now. Do I really trust God? Do I really trust God that he can provide my needs? Do I? I mean, that's just our thought process in it. And that's one thing I have to think about. And so we do, we clean out, we get rid of. Uh, we do have some junk that we do need to get rid of as well. Um, but we're working on it. We all, it, it's a process. That's why I was talking about in this book, book about the refuge and the rubbish. It takes work to do it. And sometimes we've got to, we can't do it all in one day. It's a process. So don't get upset about that. So in, in other translations, refuse gate was called the dung gate. <sighs> it's the areas that were exposed in the valley. I'm not easy to let go of control, so sometimes you want to control things. Um, I talked about last week about potty training. <sighs> For boys, number two is the hardest part to potty train because it's a different muscle. Again, refuse. I mean, we're not used to it, right? It's a different muscle. We're not used to doing this. So we give grace, right? 
but it still needs to go, right? So the valley experiences used by God to clear away the rubbish so that true faith, revived by the fire, can come forth and produce fruit. Clearing away the rubbish in our lives is never easy, but the benefits of this experience can be seen in the next gate. Before we get there, we got Hebrews 12, 2. Looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. The first incentive for our belief in the one who brings our faith to maturity. Who, for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him, endures the cross. Disregarding the shame, it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and his completion of his work. I cannot get distracted. I have to keep my focus on Jesus. Why am I willing to get rid of it? Because I want Jesus more than that stuff. I want Jesus rather than that baggage. I want Jesus rather than that feeling. I want Jesus rather than that. See, when Pastor John and I made a decision, when we got saved, we had to change our life. We had to change the way we acted with each other. Why? Because we wanted Jesus more than we wanted each other. Because if we kept the relationship the way it was going, we wouldn't have been in freedom. It would have been harder for us to break that. Because we would have sought, and, and, and it would have been unhealthy because if I'm not willing to lay down this relationship to establish a relationship with him, I will never be satisfied. I will constantly look to that individual as my need, as my support, as my salvation, and that couldn't be. I had to let it go. And when letting that part of our relationship go, I had to be okay with him walking away from me because I knew that if I did that, he still had a, somebody for me. He went and didn't desire for me to be not loved. He loved me. So I needed that. All right, the next gate is called the fountain gate. So when we get rid of all the rubbish and all that stuff, we got to get clean, right? So that's the fountain gate. It's located extremely close to the refuse gate. And that's found in Nehemiah 3.15. And it was the gate used for cleaning and going through into the temple. John 7.38 I talked about the, livers, the rivers of living water. Jesus wants us free. Flowing waters need to go through you. Well, I added another scripture that I found this week. It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 23. So now in a large house, there are not only vessels and objects of gold and silver, but also vessels and objects of wood and earthenware. And some are for honorable, noble good use, and some for dishonorable, more common good. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, which are dishonorable, disobedient, sinful, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart for a special purpose, and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. So there is a step of holiness we have to step into. But there's a cleaning that he does through him. It's through Jesus. Separated from him, I can never truly be holy. But he desires that I do be holy. So I've got to do that. He says, run away from youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those believers who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant speculations, useless disputes over unedifying stupid controversies. I see a lot of that going on. Um, <laughs> since you know that they produce strife and give birth to quarrels. I am not about anything that produces strife or give back to quarrels. Why? My question is always, what does this have to do with eternity? If it doesn't, that's trash. I'll leave that alone. Because I want to have the rivers of living water flow through me. The next gate is the water gate. How is this different from the fountain gate? Well, water, this water gate led to a spring, which is cl uh, close to the Kidron Valley. And if you know anything about the landscape of Israel, this is next to the Mount of Olives, which is next to, is close to the largest graveyard in the world for Jews. Um, this is something that they held on to. This is something that they look forward to. This is something that this is tradition for them, right? What is tradition for you? What is something you have to hold on to that you won't let go? 
the word. The word isn't life to you. You can't survive. I mean, you can, but it's not a good life. So I've got to water myself in the word. I've got to hold truth to the word. Ephesians 5.26 says, So that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God. Psalms 119.9 says, How can a young man stay pure? Only by living in the word of God and walking in his truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the word of God alive to us personally. Our allowing cleansing, encouragement, and direction to take place in our life. The word is important to my restoration. The word is important to my rebuilding. The word is important because it's going to help me tear down areas that I need to be t- torn down. The word is important. Now, how, what does this have to do with Jesus? Let me show you. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, before all time, was the word. And who was the word? Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God himself. The word. You've got to know the word. You've got to have your word. You've got to have that inside of you. Remember, these gates aren't just one step process. This is the things you have to constantly flow in and out of, walk through, okay? The next gate is the horse gate. And I spent some time on this one too last week. It talks about Nehemiah 328. Above the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each one in front of his own house. I wanted to leave this verse in here because I wanted to show you something. The priests made repairs. Because at the horse gate, this is where the horses would ride out to battle. This is where warfare happened. This is where the entrance to it. Why is it important that the priests did that? You know, you are part of the priestly righteousness of, of Christ. You are part of his holy priesthood, his royal priesthood. You are a part of this. You have an important part in spiritual warfare. You are called to pray. In the entire reading of Nehemiah, you constantly see a battle. The gospel separated from this, the battle. We're, we're robbing the body of Christ really of what they're called to do. Because remember, it's the completeness, it's fullness of the gospel. The gospel, we want to be, oh, I don't have to do anything. I'm great. I've got my fire insurance. Cool. But we are in warfare. We are in a war. Why? Because the enemy does not like the fact that he doesn't have you anymore. And he doesn't want you sharing the good news. So we're in warfare. And the thing is, the more I know of the word, the more warfare is going to come up against me. Right? See, I just, I think that's so very interesting because it's really, really close to the water gate. See, we're all called to intercession. You know, some of them, I was like, I don't have the gift of intercession, but you do have been called to pray. We are all told to pray. There are intercessors in the church, but we are all called to pray. Some are more sensitive to others than this. The devil wants to divide us amongst this because he doesn't want us to deal with certain areas in our lives. The thing is, Jesus gave us the full armor, right? And we're going to talk about that. Um, or we have talked about that. So Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, bounce, the rulers, the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. If you don't think that there is warfare going on, or I'm exempt from this, you have fooled yourself. To say that churches don't war in the heavenlies, we don't have assignments against us, to think that way, do you really think that you make an impact as a church? Think about that. Think about that. If I don't have a church and I don't consider the importance of me praying for my church and my pastors, do I really think they have an impact? Think about that. Do I really think I have an impact to have separated a prayer life? That's why it's important. So yes, there are demons assigned 
to us. There are demons assigned to this church. There are, but here's the thing that we have. There's also angels assigned. Psalms 91, 9 through 13 says, When we live our lives within the shadow of God most high, our secret hiding place, we will always be shielded from harm. How then could evil prevail against you or disease infect us? God sends angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go, defending you from harm. If you walk into a trap, they will be there for you and keep you from stumbling. You'll even walk unharmed amongst the fiercest powers of darkness, trampling every one of them beneath your feet. See, I'm cognizant of that. I am aware of it. So I don't confuse my angels. I watch the words that are coming out of my mouth about my circumstances and about the people that are tied to my life. The next gate is the east gate. And I didn't get to this one last week. Nehemiah 329, and then the son of Emmer carried out repairs in the front house. After him, the son, there's other names, keep, keeper of the east gate repaired the wall. See, the east gate looked towards the Mount of Olives. Cool, right? I'm going to hear some shining on this one because <laughs> Zechariah 14, 4 says, In that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in half from the east to the west by a very large valley. And half the mountain will move toward the north and half it towards the south. See, warfare is going to be the strongest before Christ returns. And he's going to return through the east gate. It's promised in his word tells us where he's going to be. That's why we look there, right? That's why it's, we're so concerned about what's going on. 2 Timothy 4, 8 says, In the future there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness, for being right with God and doing right, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that great day. And not only me, but also those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. We long for that. We want that. I can't stop doing the work of the ministry. Just because I'm warfare does not mean I'm not waiting. I have to keep doing. I was talking to Pastor John. I said, you know, at the grocery store, there was a, a, a group in front of me, and the lady at the checkout, she's like, I should have told you they'd like to do seven transactions every time they come through here. She goes, but I remember about you. You're never in a rush to get anywhere. I said, no. I said, God's taught me a lot about patience. I said, I wasn't like that. Even though I had no place to go, I, I would be impatient still. I said, but God spoke to me and said, where are you trying to go? Won't you know that I can do something in the waiting? I said, yeah, you can. And I'm building a relationship in that waiting. I'm being a light to somebody in that waiting. She knows there's something different about me. There's patience there. I'm growing in that. And she's like, I'm in awe of that. I said, no, I can't do that alone from Christ. He's the one who, who tells me that. He gives me the unction. I can grow in it. So I can't stop doing the work of the ministry. So, but here's the thing. Yes, he is coming back. And that gate is there. But there's a warning given to us. Ezekiel 44, 1 through 2 says, Then he brought me back by the way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces the east, and it was shut. Then the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it, for the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. I know we want him to return, and we're looking for that. But it's not open season yet. I have to spread the good news. I have to share the gospel. This is the time to live a transformed life. We don't camp out looking at that gate right we don't camp out there because when we do we neglect the other gates right it's like I know when I get to heaven I'm going to have a perfect body that's a promise right it's in his word but I know food's going to be good how do I know this because Jesus, one of the first things he did was he cooked breakfast for the disciples and they ate. Right? When he came back. So he eats. We get to eat in heaven. And it's going to be good food. And we're going to have our perfect bodies. Okay? I've told this. I, my job in heaven, I hope I get to work in the kitchen. 
I do. I want to. I enjoy that. I enjoy delivering. I enjoy cooking, and I like watching you eat my food because I want to see the joy in your eyes and that, mm, I like to hear that. And I sometimes make that myself when I cook. Um, but I love that. But here's one thing I do remember. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, who you received a gift from God, and that you're not your own property? Uh-oh. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus in his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. I'm going to get a great body when I get to heaven, but that doesn't mean I need to take care of this one. <laughs> right? I got to do it. So that's why I said, yes, the promise is there that he's returning, but I can't camp out there. I've got to do the work of the ministry. I've got to spread the good news. I've got to preach the gospel. Yes, part of that gospel, yes, he is returning, but we don't camp out there. The last gate is called the inspection gate. Nehemiah 331 says, after this Mao guy, one of the goldsmiths carried out repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants in front of the inspection gate, as far as the upper room of the corner. See, this is the gate that David would inspect his troops before going out. Remember, there's the horse gate? Well, there, you know, not all the troops went out through the horse gate. They go out through this gate. There's an inspection that happens. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 says, According to the remarkable grace of God, which is given to me to prepare me for my task, like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation. And now another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be revealed with a fire. And the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. If any person's work which he built on this foundation, that is, any outcome of his efforts remain and survives, this is a test. He will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up by the test, he will suffer the loss of that reward. See, we're going to get rewards. I know this is going to happen. It's promised in his word. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through the fire. Do you want to barely escape through the fire, or would you want your rewards? That's the fullness of the gospel, guys. I've got to have this transformation go in me. I've got to go through the valley. I've got to get rid rid of this refuge. I mean, it's going to burn away, but I do I want to actually just escape the fire? Is that enough for you? Because when I accepted Christ, that wasn't just enough for me. I wanted everything that he had for me. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we believers will be called to an account and must be appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one is, may be repaid for what he has done in the body whether good or bad. Each will held responsible for his actions, his purpose, his goals, and his motives. The muse, misuse of your time, opportunities, and abilities. <sighs> yeah, it was a big grace message to start with, right? There's an ouch moment. I know we want to see that gate open, that Jesus to come back, but are you ready for the judgment seat? Are you busy doing what he called you to do? Don't camp out there. You're not in the grave. So that means you haven't been inspected yet. You still got time. Just because I'm new in Christ doesn't mean I have a path to walk through. I cannot harden my heart because it's going to eventually go through a fire. It's going to go through a process. And see, Psalms 51, 1 through 3, and verse 10 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness and guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my transgressions. Are we conscious of that? Do I care? Do I care about that? I should. Because how can I present the good news? How can I present the gospel if I didn't care? Am I like King Hezekiah? It doesn't affect me. I'm going to pass through the fire. I got the golden ticket, 
right? <laughs> I, got, I get to go to heaven. What else do I need to do? Well, I want my rewards. I want everything he has for me. I want my crowns, okay? I want to be able to have this great job. I don't want to have to go through basic training when I get to heaven because you know what? You're going to have to go through remedial classes if you don't do it here. All right? We have an eternity. This part is so short. I have an eternity ahead of me. So I'm conscious and I acknowledge that my sin is always before me. I am still going to do wrong. I'm still going to make mistakes even though I'm in Christ. So create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew and right and steadfast by spirit within me. Once you get restored, you've got to allow the word of God to work in your life. It's not a come and get healed and then go home process. It's the only thing that's going to preserve me is the word of God. Nehemiah 8, 2 through 13, 12 says something. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read all of this because all the names. But Ezra brought the revelation to the congregation. He brought forth it to the men and women, everyone capable of understanding. He's going to tell them, you know what? We need to have a celebration. We just overcame something. We have victory in this. It wasn't complete. They were going to have to do things. They are going to have to keep restoring. They were going to have to keep building. But they celebrated. We need to celebrate. We need to learn to celebrate. Stop being so down and out and looking at the next problem. Celebrate your victory now. Have celebrations. And that's what he did. So he opened up the book. Every eye was on him. He raised on this platform. He explained the word. And they were like, yes. And they fell in knees to the worship in their ground. And I want to hear in their verses 7 through 8, in a part 8, he goes, they translated the book of the Revelation God so that people could understand it and then explain the reading. I want to explain something. They made it real to them. Sometimes we need to look at different explanations because it needs to be real to us. We need other translations. We need that. And here's the important part. I want to go down to the last uh, verse 12. So the people went off to feast, eating and drinking, including the poor, in a great celebration. Why is it important that we have different explanations? Because now they got it. They understood the reading that had been given to them. I'm not stuck on one thing. Why? Because I want everyone to get it. And if certain things are left out, what's my heart intent? What's the hard intent of people reading? Am I going to tell someone you're wrong, you don't know the fullness because you're reading the wrong translation? No, because I don't want to kill what they're trying to grow inside of them. I don't. I don't want to do that. I do read different translations. I don't think there's just one. You might just say, this is the one and only inspired. King James, I'm sorry, he was a sinner, and he did some awful things. I do not think that he is the perfect man and it's the perfect translation. But that's me. If you think that way, that's you. And I love you and you can keep reading it if you want to. Because if you can grow in it, praise God you grow in it. If I grow in reading multiple ones, praise God I'm growing and reading multiple ones. This should not be something that we divide over. Right? So, now, we get rid of the rubbish. We're being restored. We're getting to a place where we're in the Word, the uncompromised Word. This is not psychology. This is not 10 steps to a better life. This needs to be a place where celebration, where there's joy. Until you start the restoration process, the Word will not bring joy to you. You need God's presence. You need God's anointing. You need God's glory. It's hard to enjoy and understand the word when you're all messed up and tormented. It's hard to walk in the word that way. So when the gates are restored, authority is restored. When the gates are restored, whatever is bound in heaven is bound on earth. Whatever is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. So restore your gates, restore your authority. Nehemiah was sent by God the same way the comforter was, the Holy Spirit, to heal, to help, to restore we are no longer a broken city without walls. 
Psalm 126 comes right after Nehemiah. See, like I said, I'm reading the chronological Bible, and so you can see how things were written. And Psalms 126 comes right afterwards. It says, When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, to Jerusalem, we are like those who dream. It seems so unreal. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the stream beds in the south, the Negev, are restored by torrents of rain. They who sow in tears shall reap with joyful singing. He who goes back and forth weeping, carrying his bag of seed for planting, will indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Do you know Jesus? Do you have the word? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are you ready to be made whole? John 1, 11 through 13, and this is my last verse. He came to that which was his own, that which belongs to him, his world, his creation, his possession, and those who were his own people. He came to what he was his own. This belongs to him. The word, the world, the earth, his creation. We are his created. It belongs to him. And he came for it. And they didn't receive and welcome him. But to as many who did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. Not all of God's created are his children. You are not his child until you accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. But that does not mean we don't love his children. I mean, his, his created we still love his creator because it is his created. He still came for them even though they are, might not have accepted him. To become children of God, that is, to those believed to and hear and trust and rely on his name, who were born not of blood, not of natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, physical impulse, nor of the will of man, that of natural father, but of God, that is divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. This is the fullness of the gospel. Why do I keep coming back to this? Because he didn't just want to be your savior. He is my Lord. But he came to make me whole. Rebuild or tear down, it's your choice. It's your choice. We've all been given that choice. First step, have you gone through the sheep gate? If you haven't gone to the sheep gate and you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that now. I'll have Pastor John help me out with this stuff. So if there's anybody here... Let's reverence the Lord right now. Let's just close our eyes in this place. Yes. If you've never taken the first step in restoration and finding meaning and finding hope, that first step is the sheep gate, which he has brought out so clearly. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the first step. Every other gate she talked about of growth and healing and restoration only can happen if that first gate is constructed and then opened in your life. You've never opened that gate in your life. And today you say, Pastor, I want to do so. lift your hand toward heaven right now say that's me I want to make that decision today you may be watching right now say pastor that's me I might not can see your hand raised but he can and then if you'll just reach out to us right now we want to pray with you pastor that's me I'm believing that there are people that are watching that that's them. The Bible says to open up this gate, we have to do two things. The first is to believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a holy life, that he was crucified on a cross, and that he rose from the grave. If you believe that in your heart, the next step is, is to confess that with your mouth. So I want to lead us in a confession if that's you, you're watching right now. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I come before you now a sinner. And I need you to be my Savior. I have faith in my heart that you're the Son of God. That you died for me. You gave your life for me. And now I want to give my life to you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord, my Savior. I repent from my ways. And today, I make a choice to follow your ways. Jesus, you are Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.